So our school uh, was uh, founded in 1916 with a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation. And so we're thinking a lot about the anniversary, that anniversary, and how we celebrate it. And uh, we'll start in July of this year. And we think about 25% of that, of that celebration should be our history. And about 75% should be our future. And our future uh, is going to rest on how well we do advocacy. So what do we do well as a school of public health? We generate evidence. We do research. Right? We create the science and the facts that form the lever, the data with which we can move mountains. But, but if that data sits on the shelf, if, if that work gets published and collects dust, then we haven't done our entire job. Uh, Linda Gates was here a couple of years ago, 2011, I guess. And, and for those of you who heard her speak, she spoke passionately about her commitment to improving the lives of people all over the world. And that made me reflect on this issue about advocacy. And I wrote a dean's letter about it. And, and, and in thinking about it, it goes back to the very beginning of our school. Uh, William Henry Welch was a scientist who believed that you needed to be a strong advocate for science and, and for the, for the uh, impli implications for health for all our work. And then and as I think about uh, you know, uh, advocacy at our school, I think the person who, for me, really is the shining example of, of advocacy based on doing research and then, and then advocating is Susan Baker. So Susan Baker, many of you know, she was, is a pioneer in injury prevention. Uh, and she, uh, she uh, uh, discovered that uh, there was a very high mortality for babies who were carried in their mother's arms in the front seat of cars. And so once she demonstrated that, she then worked tirelessly with uh, uh, many of the people in this room, Andrea Geelan, Ellen McKenzie, to change the law to require car seats. So that's why we have car seats. That's an example of the kind of effective advocacy that we're talking about today. But lots of folks in the school do advocacy. And, and of course, um, the biggest advocate for advocacy is Ying Ramon. And Ying has an incredible ability to get ministers of health, uh, to get uh, world leaders in a room, teach them about uh, research and evidence, and then get them to make the next step to take actions. He can even get senators in the room. So, so, so we have a long history of advocacy here at the school and, and evidence-based advocacy. And I see it as an extension of the research and, and the training of leaders that we do. So I think the advocacy group, they've come together to uh, for, have this forum, and you heard about the structure. And I, I would say that what we hope to get out of this and, and what we know that advocacy can accomplish is to improve policy and laws, make sure they get implemented, increase uh, the uh, resources for health interventions, and make sure that they're used well address issues of health equity that go beyond whether people have just access to care, but the social determinants of health that influence how we live or the physical and social characteristics of our lives. And then getting the knowledge out there, making scientific data more easily accessible uh, to policymakers and, and health. And I was at an advisory board meeting in New York uh, a week ago, and at the end of my talk, uh, somebody said to me, you know what's the trouble with you scientists? Nobody can understand you. So that, that was pretty that was pretty depressing to hear that, but, but, uh, but it was good that he was being honest. And then, of course, I told him what was wrong with him. But, um, <clears throat> but then in advocacy, we want to shift uh, behaviors and norms. So, so I know at the end of the day, you're going to come up uh, for a roadmap of how we do that better at our school and how we train people in advocacy and evaluate it how we take the science of monitoring evaluation, look at interventions, and come up uh, and, and make uh, uh, even better interventions.